right, I want to welcome everybody to our call tonight. It's a fantastic opportunity to uh, hear from David Green, the founder of Hobby Lobby, uh, which is an arts and crafts chain that is now more than four and a half billion dollar company and uh, privately held too, and that's amazing. They have over 800 stores and 35,000 employees in the U.S. and opening a new store every week. And, uh, you know, recently Hobby Lobby opened the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C. that I'll be going to soon. And uh, so today we're talking about his new book, Giving It All Away and Getting It All Back Again, The Way of Living Generously. Well, David, thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Welcome to our uh, webinar today. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Well, David, you you know, reading this book, it was an, really an inspiring book because you weren't born into wealth, and uh, you pretty much grew up in pretty humble circumstances in Oklahoma, and your dad was a pastor, and you cite how your mom had a great impact on your life. Can you give us a little bit about the uh, the background and, and what you grew, with, grew up in? Oh, so I am so uh, proud of my heritage. I had a, a mother and father that really loved the Lord, and that uh, you, you knew that when we were being uh, the six children. We saw it in our parents. We saw them in their prayer life and their reading the Word. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that stood out most for me as I was uh, reared was the fact uh, of how important uh, the eternal was in my parents versus the temporal. They really, really mm -hmm. wanted to focus their lives on things that were going to matter a uh, hundred years from now, a thousand years from now. So those were the things that I think that really impressed me most about my mother and my father for that fa for that matter. Now, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I had five brothers and sisters, and all of them went into the ministry, a pastor's, pastor's wife. And so I was left uh, being the uh, black sheep, or at least I saw myself that way for for quite some time. Yeah, you you talk about that in the book, which is uh, very important for us to discuss because, you know, your mom had a plaque on the wall that basically said, you know, anything you do that's not for the Lord is not worthy, of, <laughs> almost has no spiritual value. And so you, you sort of picked up this uh, shame uh, about being in business. How did you transition out of that to realize that, you know, your calling in business was a spiritual calling? Yes, exactly. Yeah, the plaque said, we have but one life. Soon it shall pass. Only what's done for Christ for last will last. And so it really didn't say anything negative about anything other than the fact that this is, you know, it goes back to that eternal versus temporal that my, my folks were so committed to. And so, yes, uh, I don't think my mother and dad understood that you could have a calling outside or that you could affect people or be uh, an instrument to affect people outside of being a pastor, a missionary, uh, because I never necessarily heard that. But I did get into business, and I, 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 I wasn't taught that that could be my calling. And so that bothered me that I wasn't called by God to be a pastor, an evangelist. But I finally learned in time because of different things that God would ask us to do, and we knew. And then we would see confirmation of what we were doing well, that this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. So I tell people that this is my calling, and I think we can all be called at whatever we do. And in fact, I go so far as saying that I think I, I know. I tell my wife from time to time I sense God's anointing on my life. So I'm anointed, I believe, to do what I do, just like a pastor might be anointed in the in the pulpit. Yeah, and... Uh... How have you seen this whole idea change in the last 20 years in terms of people getting an understanding about their work life being a calling? You know, I think uh, with uh, people like yourself, I think it's helping in that area, and you're seeing more people talk about our, our having callings outside of, of just the uh, direct work you do in a local church. Or, and so I'm, I'm hoping and I think I'm seeing more uh, in understanding that we can all be called in a different way and we can have an effect on lives wherever we are. And so I, my, I'm hopeful that we are moving in the right direction there. Yeah, we still got a lot of church leaders that need to need to get this message, but it has changed dramatically in the yeah. last 15 years, so that's yeah. good. 
Yeah. So, yeah, I, I I do think that that I have found in my in my past, uh, and I've got a great pastor now, but I have seen in my past that, uh, in fact, I heard one pastor get up and say that he feels like your giving, all your giving, needs to be funneled through the church, you know, rather than God speaking to an individual. Uh, you know, obviously ties need to be tunneled through there, but uh, and that's the understanding still of some. But uh, I'm glad to see that there's more and more understanding that a uh, businessman or anybody uh, in, that's not uh, directly working at the church uh, can have a calling on their life. Amen. Well, you know, uh, I was really fascinated and, and, you know, felt the emotion of your story when you started talking about the realization that God owned your business. And a lot of people say that, but not many people actually put feet to the fire the way you have done and you got very specific in the book on some of the steps you took uh, to actually uh, make that a reality you know one of the things you say in your book is if I don't use Hobby Lobby's earnings to touch people for the Lord I don't see the reason for me to be in business at all tell me about how that came about for you well, it's, I, I think it started uh, with my rearing uh, of, of knowing that nothing is worthwhile. I mean, I think I was raised to think about uh, temporal. And so if you really think about building a big company, you have an effect someone for eternity, it's really easy to come to the point of, you know, so what? And in fact, I think one of the last chapters in my f- first book says, so what? And I talk about what God has done and what we have built, what God has built with a lot of great people. And then the last chapter says, "What? so what? And so that's the same way I feel today is God has given us this business. And uh, there was a time where I had Christian uh, businessmen that would come in here that were really supposed to really know about wealth and, and um, how to take your assets and, and carry them down. And they were they were doing it in such a way that you just take this tree and you break it up into limbs and you give it to your kids and then the, those kids get some limbs and pretty soon you, this is where you are. But God just talked to me and said, you don't have anything to give away if you say I own it. And so that's where it all started. And that, that was during a, a time of a lot of prayer and very difficult time because I saw that the way they were asking me to do it, <clears throat> it just it just didn't feel good and I knew it wasn't good. So... We just decided that our business is going to be owned by God. And you said it a lot. Of, it's easy to say God owns your business. We all say that as Christians. But God has talked to us about what does that look like. And for us, it looks like we're not owners. So we do not own this business because we've signed off on it. It may be in our trust, the stock, but 100% of the voting stock is into Green Stewardship Trust, where we guide this as a group, as not owners. We are not owners. So if this business is sold, 90% of it would go into NCF for ministries, and the other 10 would not be for us. It would be for for our kids' uh, schooling, for health situations, and maybe for widows, things of that nature. So we do not own this business. We've signed it off, and uh, we feel good that we have taken that action. Yeah, and you give 50% of the profits from the business to Christian causes, and that alone is a, an incredible thing to do. Um, you know, so that's uh, – in reading your book, you kind of go through the metamorphosis of how you came to some of those things. And I would encourage everybody, if you have not read the book, to read the book because uh, there's a lot of nuggets in this thing that if you're a Christian business owner, you really need to – to be able to understand the seriousness of, of what you've been entrusted to. And I think that's what you reinforce is, is that you've been entrusted to something. Can you speak to that? Yes, I think it's really important here to make that, uh, that gulf that we have to, to go from of saying that we own a business. I mean, that God owns it, that God really owns it. And in that, uh, uh, we just have come to the conclusion that we're stewards, and then we feel a big responsibility. Um, this money that we have to give was God's before we we earned it, and it's God's afterwards. So we're put in a position, an awesome position, to pray about how we uh, uh, give the monies that we give, 
and make sure. So we we come together as a committee. That's on, uh, there's several family members that we come together once a month, deciding how we and where we give this money. We've already get the amount is already set. It's half of our earnings from the previous year. So we're not deciding on how much to give. That's done for the last five six mm-hmm. years. But what it is is where do we put this money so where it produces the most uh, results, and so that's where we pray and and work to uh, see that we are, we're just stewards and we want to see ourselves as stewards and not owners. Yeah, you know, you host some meetings of other uh, business owners and leaders and help them understand this whole process of of being generous. In fact, you learned this generosity from your parents, even though. They had very limited income. They were quite givers. Tell us about that. You know, one of the things that I talk about in giving, I says, you know, we need to start with tithing. You know, tithing for me is like training wheels on a bike. You know, it's just a beginning. And I love to see my mother and dad, how they would, back in the 40s when I was born, how they would, a lot of our church members would not have dollars and cents. They would have a chicken or they would have some items out of their garden. And I would watch my mom and dad write those things down so that they could pay tithes on them. And so I saw their faithfulness, and then I also saw, saw God's uh, blessing them. He didn't bless them in terms of dollars and cents, but he blessed them in all the important ways, their health, their marriage, till death doeth part, their children serving God, all the things that you would want on your deathbed, they had. And so I saw how that God blessed them in their giving, and so it encouraged uh their children to give. They, we tie, you start with tithing, and then you start giving and uh, from there. And uh, it was certainly a good example that I had from my parents in their giving. Yeah. And then you say in your book that, uh, you know, the, the um, most generous um, generation of giving are baby boomers and that uh, you're seeing another trend that's uh, quite different among next generation givers what what are you seeing in that regard well you know if you see the numbers on 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 giving from the past to the present i don't know that we're teaching a tithing the way we should i don't like to teach it in a legalistic way i just like to say you know god's word says that uh the windows of heaven you pay your tithes uh it's going to open up you in there you have blessings because you pay, pay tithes so when you pay tithes, you're doing a couple things. You're saying, you know, I believe God's word, and you're also saying God comes first in my life. And I don't see, when you see the numbers of, of Christians and their giving now, I think the numbers I'm seeing is about 3%. Uh, someone doesn't believe that God is going to bless you evidently because the numbers that I see, and it seems like it's falling in the younger generations, I don't know that we're teaching uh, God's word about tithing and the blessings of tithing the way we should. Yeah. You have some great stories in the book that talk about how you saw the activity of God in your giving, where you took a step on a step out to give uh, X number of dollars, in some cases m- more than you even had to give, and uh, yet God met that. And, and the other person on the other end, it was a divine connection for them as they had committed to new projects, and but they didn't have the money, and then the money you gave them was exactly what they needed, and that happened for you quite a number of times. Yeah, and, and it was those times that I knew that I had confirmation. You know, when I when mm-hmm. I, I gave them out that God had asked me to do, and at the end, at the other end, it was what they needed exactly. There, those type things have happened, and you have, we we talked about it earlier. You know, there was a time that I knew that I'm in God's perfect will, and I, and, and those are the situations you're talking about that uh, let me know that it's okay for me to be a merchant. And, um, and, and so I feel very comfortable where I am, where it was not the same uh, when I started in, in business. Yeah. Well, another radical uh, decision that you made that uh, I think a lot of business owners read, read what I'm about to say and say, oh, my gosh, uh, you've limited the amount of money you take from the business in the form of a salary that has been the same for the last 11 years, and you you say that that's not going to change anytime soon. How did you come to that decision? Well, um, 
You know, it's uh, I I do well. My salary's fine and it's good. And by the way, it's 13 years now. It was uh, 04, okay. I think, when uh, when I, the last time I got a salary. And and so the family, all of us, uh, no matter what we earn. When I read this uh, questions that you had, I went back and I saw that we earn eight times what we did in night when I the last time I got a raise. And I'm only saying that to say that this growing businesses and having another 60 stores next year is not about me. It's about doing as much as I can. I do not apologize by telling people I make as much money as I can in a fair way so that I can do more in terms of the ministries that we do. And so there's only a certain amount of salary, and, 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 and I do well. I have a nice home. I have nice car and cars, et cetera. But there's not a need. I don't see a need that I need more money than I have now because I'm not looking to buy huge yachts and other homes. I'm not, I'm not looking to do that. And so uh, that's, that may be the wrong, for me, the wrong stewardship of what God has given us. And so we're hmm. growing this business to be, to be able to do more ministry, and that's, that's our heart. Yeah. One of the things you cover in the book is about the importance of family, and and uh, you've been very intentional about involving uh, three going on four generations now uh, of the Green family and trying to mentor them and help them adopt the same values that you have and the importance of family being together. Where do you see uh, that today in terms of families that you look at, and, and why is that so important? Well, it's like I said, the the great gifts that my mother and dad got from their giving was not financial wealth. I think if we think about, you know, our last days and, and our legacy, I don't think it's going to be we want on that last day to have tons of money in the bank because we're going to see that that has no value at all. But the true value is the legacy we leave in our family. So that has always been very, very important to my wife and I because it was important to our families. And so because of our heritage, we knew how important it was. I've said that if I lost one, one of my ch- children, one of them, because of the wealth or because of Hobby Lobby, I would rather not this exist at all because it's more important for us to have great marriages and to have families uh, that serve the Lord. And uh, I have, God has blessed me with great children that serve the Lord and uh, great grandchildren. I have 10 grandchildren and 11 great grandchildren. So uh, we have 35. Barbara and I started uh, in, in 61. We've been married now for 56, 57 years and uh, tomorrow it's 57 years. So uh, we're, uh, we're excited about our family, but we feel like that we need to put a lot of emphasis on something that's much more important than, than uh, accumulating uh, dollar wealth. Yeah. You made another radical decision, and that was in your estate planning. Uh, No one in the family can touch more than 10% of the value of the company. You've set in place a structure that gives 90% to Christian causes. You know, how difficult was that to do in dealing with three generations? Yeah, but let me say we can't even touch the 10. The the, the 10 is about... We can't touch one one percent of it if the company is so ninety percent goes into a foundation. The other ten is for uh, for various things. It's not really wages. So we mm-hmm. we all work here for a salary. Every one of us, none of us get anything as far as the value of the company. And but when we we had started by giving our children, we gave about fifteen percent of the hundred to our children, and they had already set their wills up so that their children would get what they had, and we saw that that was wrong. We really didn't like it. We felt like this business needed to be in a tree form, that it's in one Mm. form and God owns that. Once you start dividing up the limbs, then you can have all kinds of frictions in the family that you shouldn't have. And so we asked them if they would sign off to where, yes, it's still in the ownership is in their trust, but they can never touch it. And so all of our children and our grandchildren signed off. We had no problem. They were they were glad to do it. They said, I don't know if I could have handled being a multimillionaire or a billionaire. 
So that was done. It's, it was radical, uh, but I, we just I sleep well at night knowing that God owns this and we don't own it. Mm, amazing. Well, let's shift a minute and talk about uh, an event that literally changed your life, and that uh, was your experience with the Supreme Court, where Hobby Lobby sued the U.S. government over the Obamacare requirement to provide for prescription drugs and services designed to abort babies. Tell us how that uh, – I can imagine the gut-wrenching time you went through with that, a lot like Abraham and Isaac, because – it was going to cost you a million and a half a day if you lost this case. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about uh, all of that situation. Well, it really started with our attorney that takes care of our uh, insurance uh, for our employees, uh, saying that when when the new uh, policy comes in, that we had to have four prescriptions on there that we know that would take life, abortive fascia uh, prescriptions, there were four. Now, we pay for 16 contraceptive uh, for our employees, and that, by the way, the news would never tell you that, you know, that we do pay for those in our in our contracts and in our insurance. But there were four that we knew that we couldn't do, and so um, we called the family together because we knew making a big decision would, would affect all the family. And everyone that was 16 and older, we called together. And we started with the youngest, uh, 16. And I didn't want to start and say, this is what we want to do. I wanted to hear from three different generations. Our gen- grandchildren uh-huh. were there, our children, their wives, and my wife and I. And so we just started. And we some of them would ask, what else can we do? Is there something else? But when we got through, there was no one that was willing to pay for us to pay for someone's uh, abortifacia uh, uh, prescription. And so because of that, uh, we were only, the only thing we could do would be to, uh, to sue our government, which we love. And uh, so that's what we had to do. We had to actually sue our government, and that's where it all started. Uh, and um, <clears throat> because if what the fine was was $1.3 million a day. Well, how did we get that with the number of employees that were, we had and how many was on our insurance pot? It was like about $36,000 per employee uh, because mm. they were going to charge us $100 a day. And so that was the number that we came up with. So we knew we were not going to, to do that, and yet the fine was so huge. So we just had to, to sue the government. So we started here at the local um, – federal office the judge says that he's not going to give you know give us relief on that and uh, so when they say that in injunction we were looking for an injunction they're basically saying no you're going to have to pay that 1.3 million a day so we went to the 10th circuit three judges saw it and basically they came back and says no you got to pay 1.3 million a day so we we asked the judges at the Tenth Circuit if all of them would look at it, the full nine, and the full nine saw it, and we got the injunction. So that only meant we were relieved paying the 1.3 until uh, – and by the way, we got that injunction at the Tenth Circuit on Friday, and Monday was when our new insurance policy would have gone into effect that had to have these and and did not have those. And so that's kind of where we were, and of course everybody knows we went to the Supreme Court. But people ask me about that because when I first saw this, I couldn't sleep at night. I, I lost rest for two or three weeks. Uh, 1.3 million was focused on us. But we really, Barbara and I, sit down and says, you know what? There's only one decision to make here. We've made the right decision. And so we, from that point on, were at total peace for two reasons. One, I think we said no, that we made the right decision. This is the decision God would have us to make. And then a of course, a tremendous amount of prayer from all over the world. So I think the prayer got got us through us, and then the fact that we were standing on God's word, we knew we were doing the right thing. So we got through it, and we just thank everybody that prayed for us. Uh, we did get get a good uh, we did get it resolved in the Supreme Court. Yeah, that's a powerful story, and uh, probably. Uh, I, I meant to ask you this: Has there been any consideration for a movie on the, your story there? Well, we've heard it, you know, a little bit, but <clears throat> nothing's happened yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it, it could. It, it has it the could drama. Be, 
Yeah, it was, it was, uh, yeah, the day we were all, our family were gathered when we were listening on TV because we knew that it was, uh, uh, it was like, I think the last day of June it was going to, we were going to hear. And so we were, we were screaming and hollering a little bit on that day. So we were, we were so uh, relieved, but at the same time, people would always ask me, what would you do? And I said, I don't know, but I'll tell you what the family was not going to do is we're not going to pay for someone's abortion or something that could cause death because life begins at conception and only God creates life and that we were solid in that. And, uh, we were, we were not, we were not willing to do that. Yeah. Amen. Well, you talk about, uh, a scripture that you'd like to have on your tombstone and I want to read it for our audience. First Timothy two. 7 through 8 says, This and this only has been my appointed work, getting this news to those who have never heard of God and explaining how it works by simple faith and plain truth. Um, sharing the gospel is very important to you, and, and why is that? Uh, has, how has that come to be mm-hmm. such an important value for you? Well, I think it goes back to my rearing with pastors that uh, goes back to that temporal versus eternal. So that particular verse is good to me because it talks about has been my appointed work. So that was a big thing in my life. And so now I know this is my appointed work, as Paul knew what his was, but this is my appointed work. So that comes together with what I'm going to do with it. And I'm going to do things that tells people about God and uh, explaining how it works. And so that all of a sudden my appointed work takes me to things that are eternal. So that's why that scripture is so important to me. It brings together my work and the results of my work to have um, eternal value to employees and uh, people all over the world if we can, uh, as much as we can, you know, as many people as we can tell about the good news. Yeah. There are a couple of other verses that uh, you talk about in your book. They're very important. First Timothy six seventeen through 19 Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in. Uh, And then Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where bombs and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moss and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And so you guys are really modeling that uh, out there and uh, on ins- inspiration. So those of you listening uh, and um, didn't know what the, you just came into the call late, uh, we're talking about David Green's book, Giving It All Away and Getting It All Back Again, The Way of Living Generously, and he's really modeling that. So is there any other uh, things that speak to you about those verses you'd like to share? Well, I think that the uh, only thing I could share other than what, what's been said, which these are such great verses, is just uh, we want this to be our legacy. Uh, I think uh, it's never too soon for any one of us to think about our legacy, and we want our legacy not to, uh, not to think about the treasures here, but we're thinking about things um, that uh, – that brings people to know Christ. So th- those are very important scriptures that says so much about a family's legacy. Yeah. Well, let's shift and talk about something that I know is uh, really dear to your heart. That's uh, a recent project called the Bible Museum uh, that just opened. Uh, in didn't it open in January? Yes, it, uh, actually November. November was our first. November. Uh huh. Uh huh. How did that all come come about? Well, it, it wasn't something we planned. Uh, uh, it was really, uh, I, I think it was five or six years ago when someone came to us and wanted to sell uh, an antiquity to us, and uh, a Bible antiquity. And so we purchased it and thinking, uh, you know what, we, we had in the back of the head, it seemed like there needs to be a Bible museum. I've often said if there's only one museum in this world, it ought to be the Bible. It's the only artifact that we have that's eternal god's word man so are the only two things but we we didn't think of that as being our god called us to do that we just bought this and we want to give it to somebody and let them you know whoever opens a museum we would like to see a world-class bible museum 
And then we fa- then some other items came, and then people. It's a small, pretty small area industry, if you want to call it. And so people become knew that we were buying these, and so we started accumulating them. And by the way, we have about forty five thousand different antiquities now. But uh, uh-huh. but then it just slowly began. The family felt like that we're the ones that's supposed to do this, and so uh, we we surveyed three towns: New York. Dallas and Washington D.C. did a survey and found out that that it would be uh, uh, many many more people would show up there in Washington D.C. and that's we wanted the maximum amount of people to see God's word and to show off these uh, muse- uh, museum or these Bible artifacts. So that's that's kind of how it, it happened. It didn't happen because we planned uh-huh. it, but we took one step at a time, and so we ended up. Obviously, but we've ha- also have to say there's been a lot of people that's come alongside us and contributed, and so it, it's a it's something that we all did together. Uh, people that love this book come alongside, and our family, and we're real proud of the Bible Museum in Washington D.C. Well, we encourage everybody to go see that. Uh, I get to see it here in a few, just a month, and um, I'm. I hear great things about it. So, and if you have to be in Washington or want to make a special trip, make sure you go see that museum. Uh, David, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, is there anything you would like to challenge or encourage our listeners that uh, is on your heart? You know, it's probably would be uh, what my mother left with me that I can't get away from, and I'm glad I can't. And that is we do have but one life. Soon it shall pass. And only what's done for Christ will last. So that's uh, I'm very thankful for that heritage and, the, and a mother that uh, wouldn't let me get away from that uh, that those um, the sayings that had, was written uh, many years ago. So um, we need to do something. God has put us here for a purpose. And I often wonder if we don't have an effect on someone else for eternity, uh, what is our true purpose? So um, I think my mother's. Uh, verse there or the saying that she gave me there would be very important for all of us yeah well the book is giving it all away and getting it all back again the way of uh, living generously and uh, you can get the book uh, on our bookstore at tgifbookstore.com and we'll also add a a bonus of this interview with that and uh, by purchasing it from our bookstore you support our ministry and uh, don't give it to Amazon. They don't need any more book sales. So just send it to, <laughs> send it our way, and you'll help us do more programs like this. Well, David, there's a lot of business owners out there listening to this. I wonder if you'd offer a prayer as we close, uh, since you have such uh, real authority in this area to impart something to them. Sure. Be glad to. Father, we love you today, and we thank you for who you are. And we thank you for your son. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, that each one that's listening to this program today would uh, would listen to your words and uh, think of your words and uh, ask themselves, uh, what would God have me do with my life? What would he have him do with my talents, uh, my income, all that I have? And what would he have us to do that I would be pleasing to him in all that I do and all that I say? We thank you this day. Amen. For additional books, audio, and video resources, as well as learning about upcoming events from marketplace leaders, please visit our online bookstore at www.tgifbookstore.com.